now a good time to start? I normally think this is five minutes is enough for students in class, so that should be enough for seminar attendees as well. Um, okay, so welcome to the HGI seminar. Um, I don't know, are we just HGI people? Could be loads of people. I'm Dr. Billy Tusker Hayworth, if you don't know. Um, I'm a lecturer in disaster management at HCRI. And I'm really pleased to be chairing this event um, on bombing walls, perspectives on the functions of graffiti and street art in conflict affected spaces. And we have some great speakers. So before we get to them, um, I will remind everyone that uh, the event is being recorded, but um, in terms of your privacy or other concerns, that doesn't um, really matter because your cameras, sound, etc., are not being recorded. Um, and if you want to ask questions, um, it's best if you use the Q and A function. Um, you can post links or comments and, and things in the chat, but for questions that you want um, the speakers to answer, the Q and A is best. So um, each speaker will talk for about 15 minutes, I think, about um, their specific topics. And then we'll have a joint uh, Q&A discussion at the end. Um, so I do want you to think of excellent questions, but if you could please save them for that discussion at the end, that would be great. Um, and I'm going to start by just giving a couple of minutes um, by way of introduction to the kind of uh, themes that are informing why we decided to have this session and the broader work that um, myself and um, others at HCRI and elsewhere are doing around graffiti in conflict affected spaces. So graffiti and street art in landscapes of conflict and peace both reflect and shape public spaces and attitudes. They often provide unique insight into the lives, views and priorities of populations at a grassroots level. Exposure of non-hegemonic voices and alternative political narratives is particularly useful when exploring landscapes molded by crises and socio-political tensions, as they often leave little room for other cultural, social or socioeconomic debates. Following that space cannot be separated from politics, social science scholarship understands graffiti in particular as an important medium for urban political communication, including during times of political and socioeconomic crisis. Graffiti portrays diverse public attitudes at different scales, potentially generating both social change and tensions. In landscapes of post-conflict and division, there are a number of ways to view graffiti and street art. One, for instance, is through the medium's distinct ability to quickly and publicly subvert dominant oppressive powers through using the streets as a setting to communicate regardless of legality. Another reading lies in the hopefulness of messages shared through innovative and creative acts. Street art in the form of large scale murals can also be commissioned, form part of art festivals and tourism initiatives, and can be a valuable tool in arts based peace building. However, graffiti can also operate as a distinguisher of division and a further mechanism for intimidation and constraint on social and spatial movements. If graffiti and street art can be used to create an environment of social change and welcome, they can equally be employed to create unwelcome and entrenched division. So all three of our speakers today examine aspects of graffiti and or street art in contexts of conflict and or peace but in different ways, whether it be the function of street art as a tool in a broader context of arts and sustainable peace building, graffiti as part of an urban subcultural narrative of historical and ongoing resistance to division, or graffiti as an emergent political democratizing and disruptive phenomena during times of heightened crisis. So our first speaker will be Dr. Lydia Cole uh, from Durham University. So Lydia is a postdoctoral researcher at Durham University on the project, The Art of Peace, engaging across feminist international relations, critical peace and conflict studies and visual global politics. Her current research examines uh, curational politics and arts-based activism in Bosnia and Herzegovina. She is published in Critical Military Studies and International Feminist Journal of Politics. And so I will hand over to Lydia now.
and you need to unmute. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Billy. Um, I'm Dr. Lydia Cole. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about um, curating street arts in Mostar, Bosnia, Herzegovina. Um, so this is part of ongoing research into the impact of street arts um, in peace formation um, in Bosnia. And specifically today, I'm going to be focusing on the street arts festival in Mostar. Um, so this is an annual festival that started in 2012. Um, and it's a festival of kind of curated street art as opposed to kind of street art that emerges a bit more organically. Um, and since it started, it's amassed over about 100 uh, different murals. Because the, the street arts festival is curated, it means that the street art that's part of the festival is legal. Um, painted with permission from both the city um, and sometimes residents, residents in the buildings where the murals are painted. So the street arts festival organizers don't try to overly curate the festival. They kind of generally allow artists to paint whatever they want um, with the one caveat that they don't really like artists to engage with kind of cliched images of division and peace. And that's something I'm gonna be talking about a little bit in the presentation. So the presentation um, kind of hones in on a few murals which were part of the 2020 uh, Street Arts Festival, which I've been kind of following on Facebook dr uh, during the pandemic and I've also spoken to some of the artists as well. Okay, so before we begin, I wasn't sure how much of the, the audience would be familiar with the case of Mostar, so I just wanted to give a brief introduction to help you make sense of the murals and the politics of Mostar. So Mostar can be characterized as I think both a space of division um, and also cohesion in some ways. So the city is politically and institutionally divided um, which is very much a product of the conflict and uh, displacement that occurred in the 1990s war and the siege of Mostar as well. Um, Today, this is visually and spatially kind of ruined buildings, but also kind of in the spatial practices of residents on an everyday level. I think it's really important to point out that division isn't the whole story when it comes to Mostar. So grassroots peace activists, of which kind of arts actors uh, are part of, really try to challenge this division um, through kind of creating projects that create a notion of a shared public space and a public sphere um, within Mostar. So kind of engaging with Mostar's more complex landscape, they try to kind of think through, um, I guess, the possibilities for cohesion and kind of moving beyond division in the city. So this is the kind of political landscape that the festival is trying to intervene in really. Um, and I'll talk a bit about how this relates to the visual and the kind of spatial elements of the murals that are in the festival. So the first mural that I wanted to talk about is uh, this mural by an artist called Artez. He's quite a well-renowned artist from Belgrade. Um, and I include it not so much for its political content, but more to uh, highlight the story behind the decision of what to paint. So as you can see from the image, um, it's quite an aesthetically pleasing mural. Um, features uh, a woman with kind of holding um, plants in a pot. The mural kind of reflects the green landscape around the building and kind of isn't particularly challenging on the eye in many ways. So what was interesting about it when I spoke to the artist um, was around how he actually came to this idea. Um, when he was talking to organizers, he had a few ideas around um, kind of connecting to the history of the war um, and perhaps the lack of a human understanding in this time. The organizers were quite um, gently suggesting to him that he shouldn't really engage with this topic 
um, particularly as one of uh, the ideas that he kind of suggested was a more abstract mural with two opposing currents, which kind of very directly references kind of aspects of division in Mostar. Um, the organizers basically kind of told him there's already too much talk about the war and too much talk about division in Mostar and it's really not what's needed. And I think this is also particularly for someone who comes from outside um, the Mostar and Bosnia and Herzegovina context to kind of talk about these issues is also a difficult thing. Um, so in the end, the artist decided it was better to paint a beautiful image um, and something in his own words that didn't put too much pressure on the viewer. I think its location is also quite significant. So the mural uh, comes in a street called Sanchi Cheva Street, which is on the former front line. So these uh, buildings were destroyed and rebuilt in the aftermath of the war. Um, and this is a site where there's a very large concentration of murals from the festival, um, most of which kind of have this more aesthetically pleasing uh, kind of aesthetic. And I guess what, what I'm kind of trying to suggest here is that the grassroots initiative is sort of working towards a beautification of an area that would have been quite um, destroyed. So it's the politics is really in the aesthetics in this case. So the second mural I wanted to draw your attention to um, is this one by an artist called Lubomir Tolorovic. He's from a city called Banovici. Uh, it's just outside of Tuzla in Bosnia. Um, so this mural is has a kind of more overtly political message about it. Um, the kind of mural depicts a very deep handshake, um, which initially when I saw it, it kind of conveyed this message of trust um, and so I kind of immediately linked it to kind of narratives of moving beyond division in Mostar. When I spoke to the artist about the mural he kind of talked to me about how he always wanted to provoke an emotion with his his artwork and this was no exception. Now the mural was int intended to be painted originally in a street arts festival in Latvia and the artist was actually unable to travel there due to the pandemic. Um, so when he was asked to kind of come to Mostar to be part of the 2020 festival there, he wanted to kind of reinvent the idea that he had for Latvia. And I think it's kind of interesting to look at the different layers of, um, I guess, the development of, of the piece um, to kind of understand the different layers of the mural and the artist's intention behind it. So originally the artist wanted to have the deep handshake depicted with uh, two tattoos, one on each hand. So the first one would say um, in Bosnian, uh, hold on, and the other one, Prishti, which means let go. So the way the artist explained it um, was almost like a Bosnian street language, like a kind of gesture. So um, it would be, a handshake where one person would hold out their hand and the other would kind of drop it or let go as a kind of sort of joke, but greeting as well. Um, in Mostar, he decided that um, he wanted to remove the tattoos, not have those on, on the mural, which I think does kind of then have this more implied trust within it. Um, but it still has this kind of multi-layered, like gesturing towards the, the street language as well. That's important to the artist. Another interesting aspect of this um, is to do with the audience response. So the residents in the building um, saw the mural and immediately kind of linked it to the constitutive eth ethnic groups in Bosnia. Uh, with one woman saying, well, you should have painted three hands for the three. Uh, constitutive groups. The artist kind of quipped back again, like uh, signaling towards this more kind of joking approach to, to painting murals, um, that the artist's hand or his hand was the third hand, gesturing towards himself as the third ethnic group. Um, so I think what this mural does, um, kind of in terms of the visual depiction, but also the way the artist uh, engaged with the residents while painting, 
is kind of highlight um, how he was trying to play with these kind of narratives of division and cohesion through humor and um, kind of through these different layers of the handshake that are in the mural. Um, so this is actually the last mural that I wanted to draw your attention to. Um, and it's by a crew. So there were, there's three people in the crew, Save the Future crew and Alak. And they're a graffiti crew from Sarajevo and they've been working since the late nineties. So they're quite established in the graffiti and street art scene in Bosnia. So this mural is actually slightly unusual for the street arts festival in that it, it contains graffiti letters. Um, I think I've seen only one other mural in the kind of back catalogue that contains similar graffiti lettering, and this is certainly the largest one. So if we look towards the kind of more mural image that's above the um, above the graffiti let lettering, this is meant to depict a kind of futuristic mustar. You see here the kind of white stone which gestures towards uh, the white stone of the old town. And this is kind of deliberately painted in a more kind of cyberpunk, um, yeah, futuristic style. Um, the mural places the image of the old bridge at the center, signaling towards again, these narratives of uh, both unity and division. The mural also features an eye, which um, looks a little bit like a sun, either rising or setting but also again reinforces this idea of like um, looking towards a future vision, essentially. When I spoke to one of the, the street artists that uh, was involved in making this piece, he really emphasized that the mural was meant to be kind of image of Mostar in the future. Um, he said in the year 3000, what it could be and what it will be, um, and hoping towards the kind of Mostar that is a, unified place. I think perhaps more interestingly here, um, this mural is part of a kind of wider story of its location in the Partisans playground. So this has become a kind of more recent site for the festival um, with its first mural here last year in 2019. So as part of the 2019 festival, the the site, the Partisans playground was actually cleared and there was a kind of small mural that was done around the border of the playground. Um, this year they added to the murals there. So they had this mural and they had a kind of collaborative mural with lots of different symbols that kind of filled the other border. So in the socialist period in Mostar, this site would have been a real cultural hub for youth in Mostar kind of as a sports playground and as a site for kind of youth workshops and events. Up until recently, this was um, kind of abandoned and it had quite a lot of rubbish in it and wasn't really usable as a space. So the Street Arts Festival, along with the kind of organization that were working with the space um, called IDEA, um, kind of worked together really to revitalize the space and kind of reclaim it for youth activity in the city. So it's kind of interesting here how the Street Arts Festival is really engaged in redeveloping, kind of reinventing kind of abandoned spaces as well. Yeah. So I just wanted to kind of conclude with some broader kind of points that are emerging from my ongoing research into Street Arts Festival in Mostar and kind of thinking through the politics of the festival as a kind of creative a curated example of street art. So I suggest that Mostar, uh, this, yeah, Mostar Street Arts Festival intervenes in both the aesthetic and spatial landscapes of Mostar. It intervenes in Mostar's turbulent graphscapes um, by kind of countering the more kind of violent and right-wing graffiti that you see in the city. It intervenes to produce positive images and activist messages, which are not necessarily completely the same thing. And it intervenes to produce a new identity for the city. 
spatially speaking, um, it also intervenes to do something and to reinvent abandoned sites, buildings and walls by creating murals and kind of using these murals to re really kind of make these sites something other than um, abandoned and kind of a place where basically people don't want to be. And I think in doing so, the festival is really engaged in a process of shifting the infrastructure of public space towards a kind of vision of a shared public sphere. Um, I think I'll leave the presentation there. Um, but yeah, thank you. And I look forward to the Q&A. Great, thank you very much, um, Lydia. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next speaker, which is Dr. Eric Lepp from the University of Waterloo. So Eric is a peace scholar whose research explores spaces of contact and the construction of community that includes the other in conflict affected societies. He is particularly interested in the countercultural, resistant, and unexpected spaces where peace is being enacted and imagined against a backdrop of division. Eric is currently working as part of the International Consortium of Conflict Graffiti uh, that utilizes street art and graffiti to offer a commentary on contested spaces. So I'll hand over to Eric. You're far too kind, Billy. Thank you uh, for the introduction. Um, I'll pull up my presentation here. All right, great to be here. Um, just briefly, I have a, a wonderful history with HCRI. Um, I did a PhD there from 2014 to 2018. Uh, in 2018 to 19, I worked there on staff as a senior tutor in humanitarian studies. Um, I have a lot of uh, friends I can see in the in the attendees list, uh, and I, I I wish everyone over there well. Uh, the faculty, staff, the PhD researchers, uh, the students. I miss that city very much, um, which is why I'm glad, as you can see, you've expensed my trip here to the Ellen Wilkinson Building uh, for this talk. Uh, with an epic title to this event, Bombing Walls, oh, Perspectives on the Functions of Graffiti and Street Art in Conflict-Affected Societies. I can only suspect that Billy had a little bit of fun uh, coming up with that title for this event. Um, and I would like to thank the organizers, uh, Birta Fogel, Billy Tusker Hayworth, and Jessica Murphy uh, for the invitation to speak here today. Today, I will talk about the functions of graffiti, in particularly functions of studying and researching graffiti in deeply divided societies. The points I will make today come uh, from a recently published article in Third World Quarterly, written by HCRI lecturers, lecturers uh, Birta Fogel, Catherine Arthur, Billy Hayworth, as well as Dylan uh, O'Driscoll at the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute and myself. Um, I can just, there we go. Um, so quickly, I just wanna make a few comments on why I think it is important to look at graffiti in peace and conflict scholarship before jumping into an analytical guide for how to study graffiti. Disciplinarily, uh, particularly within the UK system, peace and conflict study uh, tends to be a branch of international relations, which is a branch of politics. Uh, when attached to such branches and trees, there is a long history of the subject being framed uh, from the view of top-down systematic interventions, written about and theorized by white men uh, who probably look a lot like me, and in the case of many of them, uh, also those who are able to grow much more impressive beards. Uh, this, this took a shift um, to what some call the local turn uh, with, uh, I, I would point to John Paul Lederach's work in building peace, sustainable reconciliation in divided societies, in which he breaks theoretical ground by changing the subject of politics from institutions and laws of the state to local communities and processes. This work has been followed and enhanced by many uh, other theorists uh, most notable or, or notably previous HCRI professors Roger McGinty and Oliver Richmond. 
So this once radical idea that local communities should be integrated and guide peace building has become widely accepted in theory. Um, and the ideas of a more localized approach to peace formation have been both expanded and deepened with greater input from uh, inclusion of feminist scholars, greater representation amongst academics and policymakers, and thinking beyond the confines of that politics IR tree. Um, although there is a long way to go in this regard, what comes from this general, this what comes from this is a general understanding that each conflict affected setting is unique. And although international systems may be somewhat uh, cookie cutter or mundane, the local experience is always unique and should be should not be written about in sweeping strokes. So this project on graffiti is a product of this welcome expansion while also joining a shift that also gives more focus to the aesthetic. Um, to better understand how we read, see, and hear more from local voices in areas deeply impacted by conflict. As Billy noted in his introduction, graffiti provides rich insight into societies, including different cultures, social issues, trends, and political discourses, and spatial and ter territorial identities, issues that are highly pertinent in many conflict zones. In our co-written paper, we highlight how it can do this through the lenses of resistance, communication and representation, division, uh, and memorialization and commemoration. I won't focus on these here, but they are each important to understand the value of graffiti. I will focus this presentation more on the analytical guide for studying graffiti. This guide is based on four seemingly simple elements, the spatial, temporal, political economy and representative dimensions. Simplistically, these can be viewed as where, when, who, and what. And so for those of you listening or watching to this presentation with a serious case of Zoom brain and can't be trusted to pay attention uh, because I am on your computer right now, but so is Instagram and so is Twitter, those are the four points. And now you can follow the compulsions of your Zoom brain without guilt. And uh, for Rasheen, Jessica Hawkins, Stephanie Rinaldi, Antoine, uh, keeping score on probably on graffiti bingo cards at home. I will also hopefully make it through this whole presentation without mentioning Banksy. So location, where? Location and spatial context are vital for understanding graffiti. Where it is written, its location can be as important as the actual images or written content. The meanings of pieces change or, uh, or, or are lost if dislocated from their spot. Uh, there are a few ways to look at this idea of where mattering. The first of these is that graffiti has been linked to both the appreciation and the decline of streetscape value. Uh, the value and identity. The, there are often restrictive urban management policies in place. Uh, Billy, our chair today, has done work, uh, excellent work on uh, engaging councils, particularly in Australia, with regards to their removal of graffiti. Here on the left of your screen is a picture I took in this city that I'm living in here in Canada. Personally, I think this looks a lot dumber than some of the stuff uh, that is being throwing, thrown up on the walls around this area. But perceptions of graffiti in this particular city have strong associations with both crime and vandalism. The council in this case is seeking to protect the character and identity of spaces and places. I just don't think that it is very effective given how well they've matched the paint, as you can see. But when graffiti is aligned with ideas of criminality and social decline, the writings on the walls become perceived as an indicator of risk and unsafety, urban abandon, and social decay. This commonly connects to the concept of broken windows as proposed by Wilson and Kelling, which asserts that a broken window left unrepaired in a neighborhood will lead to more broken windows and further decline. Um, so you get this idea that if left unchecked, graffiti will encourage more public markings and potentially other crimes, and thus you end up with notions of illegality, deprivation, and undesirability. But there is a flip side to this when graffiti becomes encouraged. 
And I would identify this more along the lines of the murals and street art pieces that are more colorful, community devised and curated, closely aligning with what L Lydia has just spoken about. This is an important part of the post post-conflict reconstruction idea that literally writes and draws on the walls that the violence is over and people should come visit and be present here. But you will hear much more of this um, through, through Lydia's talk and, and, and perhaps through the talk of Dina as well. Where graffiti is also matters because there's a distinct focus on audience and production. One such example of spatial importance comes from HCRI funded fieldwork conducted by Billy Hayworth, Captain Arthur and myself in Cyprus. We noticed a theme of where graffiti in the divided city of Nicosia was occurring. A quick overview. Cyprus is a divided island and for the sake of time, I will make a simplistic binary. One side identifies as Greek Cypriot and is recognized by the EU and the other side identifies as Turkish Cypriot and is recognized by Turkey. Um, through the whole island um, is, to update an old-fashioned term, a no-person's land this, that separates uh, the two sides. This runs through the island's largest city, Nicosia, and you can see it here, uh, that line that runs across the map. Billy, uh, who is chairing today's gathering and whose photos you will have noticed are used throughout this presentation, drew together a methodological approach for our initial scoping trip in 2019, which utilized discussions with local experts, walking surveys, and the geotagging of photography to enable initial mapping of graffiti in Nicosia. What his methodological approach demonstrates is that graffiti was and is occurring in specific spatial clusters or hotspots um, that you can see on the map here. These hotspots were very observable changes in the quantity and content of graffiti in relation to the location of the UN buffer zone. The closer one was to the wall that separated the two sides, impacted the concentration of graffiti, the intended audience, the message, the language in which it was written, and its cultural meaning. As such, it is important to advocate that space is an incredibly important lens through which to read graffiti. Uh, let's move on to the temporal, the question of when. Graffiti is inherently temporal and spatial, and there is a deep connection between these factors. As graffiti is painted on a wall, it can then be painted over, and new works can replace it. When re researching graffiti in relation to peace and conflict, the importance of temporality and graffiti is underlined because of the transitional and fragile nature of peace. If we think of graffiti as presenting a local voice, or as noted a minute ago, under the control of local authority, the temporality of graffiti gives researchers and observers, such as peace practitioners and policymakers, an opportunity to see attitudes and opinions shift through time and space. Uh, my colleague Dylan O'Driscoll, who has spent significant time working in Iraq and is now a globally recognized area expert based in Stockholm, Sweden, has reflected on the inclusivity and exclusivity of graffiti across time and space. He shares the example of IS or ISIS using graffiti during its caliphate as an exclusionary tactic against all who would not conform to its conservative Sunni Wahhabi Islam. In Mosul, there was a particular targeting of Yazidi and, Yazidi and Christian groups in their graffiti. As part of the territorial defeat of IS, uh, the covering up of the hateful messages that adorned the walls took place. Replacing them with writings, as you can see here in the slide, uh, replacing them with writings of inclusivity and peace. This example illustrates that in conflict affected spaces, not only do the writing on the walls change, but so do the spaces and the local dynamics and attitudes at the time must be considered. The lack of peaceful inclusionary graffiti in Mosul did not mean that these sentiments did not exist. But since resistance to IS was met with execution, such visible display was avoided. Of course, with the prevalence of graffiti and street art being captured and posted on social media sites, the same ones that some of you are doom scrolling right now as I say this, has added an element to living on permanently in some sphere and has made it easier for researchers to monitor changes and attitudes in specific spaces. 
This is particularly helpful for the researcher who is unable to travel due to uh, armed conflict and now a global pandemic. Who? To academically analyze graffiti, it is essential to understand who produced it and or commissioned it. Questions of anonym anonymity and visibility are key. Uh, artists may want to protect their identity and write themselves out of their artwork. Annika Bjorkdahl and Stephanie Kapler note that visibility is often linked to debates about the commodification of art and artwork or professionalization and commercialization of memory spaces. So the question of who paints starts with another question. Does the painter wish to be identified? And what does this tell us? Outside of what we've put in our article, I think this becomes one of the significant differences between what is categorized as street art and what is categorized as graffiti. Graffiti can be seen to occupy a space outside of the institutional. It is something resistant, transgressive, and nonviolent. This part about nonviolence is open for debate, but is part of my upcoming work on graffiti as civil resistance. Throughout Cyprus, we saw writing on the walls that advocated for migrant workers. You see this here on the left of your slide. Uh, a popular Cyprus is a popular destination for teenage Brits looking to drink cheaply and post pink sunburnt pictures of themselves on Instagram. The, the calls for greater rights for many of the Filipino workers in the hotel industry demonstrated that not all graffiti and deeply conflict affected societies are about the conflict setting in which they are based. These pieces offer a great deal of information and represent the local voice even if that voice is seen anonymously through expression of grievance. When we shift these questions to look at, at the muralized street art pieces, like the one pictured uh, on the right here, we can think of commissioned pieces with clear Twitter and Instagram handles um, for viewers to follow. In Medellin, where Birta Vogel has done some work on an AHRC funded project on the arts and peace, she visited Colombia and Medellin's Comuna 13, a place known through the Pablo Escobar and FARC embattled times of Colombia as a place of grave danger. Now there is a commercialized market for street art tours that has become integral for socioeconomic recovery. This challenges the idea of street art as resistance. The commercialization leads to questions about who pays, who really controls the space, and then similar to what you will learn in courses at HCRI taught by Rasheen Reed or Catherine Arthur, you end up with street art becoming part of the identity of a liberal peace interventionism, where decisions are made by ruling classes, elites, international actors, over what activities should be focused on as part of post-conflict reconstruction, and in the case of street art, what some parts of that activity look like. So asking who involves looking behind the picture. Finally, what can we read? To analyze graffiti in a way that incorporates resisting and subversive characteristics, it is useful to firstly consider it as a cultural product. In this way, graffiti offers symbolic representation of the identities and values of artists and often in conflict affected societies. This challenges the dominant culture uh, that, that rules the society. So it is important as researchers that we examine graffiti as a symbolic form of representation. It is through this that we can learn more about identities and influences within and across communities in a conflict. Symbolic forms in their broadest sense are the objects and devices that give form to identity, culture, heritage, ideology, allowing individuals to visualize and understand them. Catherine Arthur in her work on street art in Timor-Leste notes that graffiti can act as boundary markers, delineating differences between one collective and another, but, but that it can also be used to unite a diverse group of people under a single identity, whether it be local, national, or transnational in nature. As such, symbolic forms and representations in graffiti constitute windows into the identities and ideas of a particular community or an area. Understood within their specific cultural, political, historical context, they can reveal much about the motivations behind the art, the specific message it communicates, and the intended audience. 
Some things are easier to recognize symbolically than the other. Uh, the example of the CND peace sign or the anarchy symbol on the reclaim the streets picture uh, on this slide have some obvious literal messaging. Uh, but other texts or images may not be so clear. And to this point, if you are a fly in, fly out researcher who thinks it possible to fly into a complex setting, read the writing on the walls and then go produce your refable publications, you are doing a disservice to the messaging and its deeper meaning. For example, as I mentioned previously in Cyprus, there was a larger density of graffiti the closer one was to the buffer zone. Um, within that region, the closer one was to one of the crossing points, uh, the checkpoints that, that cross the border, uh, like the one on Ledra Street, the more likely the messaging was to be in English, written for an international audience. As Jorgensen notes, the languages have not been chosen at random, but have been chosen because of the stereotypical values more or less ascribed them, as well as the connotations carried by the individual words. Simple things like in the middle of this uh, slide here, uh, like the stenciled your wall cannot divide us may give the researcher a seemingly straightforward perspective of the artist or the author. Um, but what about a few blocks away when as a researcher you encounter an image of Turkish President Erdogan in a dress skipping over a petrol hose nozzle in one hand. Uh, a piece that requires local contextualization and once contextualized makes the English language messages seem oversimplified given the historical complexities of the island. All this is to say that messaging and communications inherent in graffiti can be multifaceted with different intended audiences. There can be contradictory in message and they can be contradictory in message and expression, but such is the experience of the people who live in these often violent settings. And so it needs to be read with this understanding in mind. I would go so far as to say uh, if graffiti is only delivering one message and if it isn't localized like that written authoritatively by IS and Mosul or even uh, that which is being sponsored by peace building INGOs in Medellin, then the voices of the locals may be being pushed out of the space of, of these spaces for a period of time. Luckily, it's all temporary and things will change. Uh, here's a, the article and a great picture of Billy, Catherine uh, and myself in Cyprus. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, thank you, uh, Eric. Um, yeah, it is a wonderful shot. I'm sure everyone's gonna take their screenshots and put that as their wallpaper. Catherine will particularly like that. <laughs> um, okay, so moving on to our third uh, speaker. And just a reminder that if you have questions, we'll, we'll take questions for all three speakers um, at the conclusion of our, our um, presentations. So next up, we have uh, Dina Yunus. Dina is a PhD candidate at King's College London, where she's currently working on finishing her doctoral thesis within the Institute of Middle Eastern Studies. Her research examines the spatial politics of graffiti writing during some of the most recent and major political protests within the city of Beirut. She has a particular interest in spatial and visual politics of youth subcultures, as well as the production of spaces of resistance within Middle Eastern post-war urban context. Okay, so over to you, Dina. Just one second. No, oh, that's not right. Hello, uh, thank you for the intro. Um, so I actually want to use a lot of the things that Eric talked about it in his talk you'll be seeing in practice with within mine and within what I'll be talking about. Um, this is mine. I, it's based on my current PhD thesis in my current work. Um, it's called Making Noise, the Use of Graffiti and Dismantling Spatial Boundaries and Barriers. Um, essentially, I research graffiti writing in Beirut, Lebanon, and I have a focus on graffiti done during major political uprisings. This talk in particular is focused on the most recent one and the most ongoing one, which is um, the Thoda, 
what has been dubbed by the Thota by the locals. Um, so yeah, and basically how the, the graffiti that has emerged during that political uprising and during this time is basically allowed to dismantle all the post-war social boundaries and divisions that have been created prior to that. And then how that dismantling in itself has allowed the public to reclaim and redefine a lot of the contested spaces in the city and then creating new boundaries and new spaces on their own terms. So just to give a little bit of context in terms of the phases of graffiti in Lebanon, um, it is the contemporary graffiti as we know as kind of the one that has emerged from New York and Philadelphia is relatively new. Um, it's only 15 years old in Lebanon, but prior to that, it, the first wave came from during the civil war, which was basically a massive war in Lebanon um, from 1975 to 2005, uh, sorry, 1975 to 1990. Um, and then basically destroyed the entire city. Um, a lot of the spatial boundaries that existed prior to the Thoda were because of all the, the political stuff that was going on back then. Um, the second you have is the contemporary scene, which only emerged in 2006 and until, re until now, until 2019. And that is, um, only emerged after the Israeli attack in 2006, when you had a few graffiti writers start to um, create little messages to remind the people of Lebanon that there is still hope. The third one is the current one, as you see, and that is the one that has occurred during the Thoda, and that is the most subversive and the most politically charged graffiti that the city has seen. Um, so I have a few examples. So here you see, this is a, for example, this is part of the first wave. A lot of the graffiti during the first wave had to do with the political militias and the political parties that were in control at the time. And really much all the graffiti was stenciled logos of the political parties. So this is, for example, the stencil of the Amal movement, which is a Shia movement. And it is aligned with Hezbollah and with Iran. Um, this is second wave comes, you start seeing a bit more of the contemporary influence, the Western influence from Europe and from the US. Um, however, a lot of it has been, starts being shifted from Latin letters into more, into Ar using Arabic letters. So this, for example, says Beirut Mabid Mut. And this actually, this was done in 2000, the summer of 2006. And it means basically Beirut will never die. And uh, it was done in really, shitty chrome paint, because that's all that people had available at the time. Um, you can see a bit more examples. Exist, who's a really prominent graffiti writer in Lebanon. Um, Me, who's a French graffiti writer, but, it, but resides in Lebanon. And this is another shift that you see within the second phase where it starts becoming a little bit more political. And this was done during the Eustink political uprising, where it was, the uprising was done in response to massive waste management crisis, hence the I can't breathe. Um, and then the, this is another one, uh, you stink, but you don't do shit. Um, just understand that a lot of the prior, the graffiti done in the first wave was essentially done as a form of territorial demarcation, as spatial boundaries and visual markers. They were done as threats and warnings. And that led to a lot of segregation across territorial and sectarian boundaries. So now we can actually talk about the Thoda. So the Thoda started in October 19, 2019, October 19, 2019, and it just was a massive eruption across the country and non Beirut. Usually a lot of the major political uprisings that have, ex that have existed before um, started or was very much centered in the center of Beirut um, and rarely ever was expanded to other major cities in Lebanon. Um, and so, yeah, and this was basically triggered by austerity taxes um, placed on the public after having also a massive wildfire crisis that occurred. And kind of been, everything had been building up and this was kind of the cherry on top. So where, like I said, the, where the Thoda differs is that there's a massive decentralization, a massive collective solidarity. 
And this solidarity, <coughs> sorry, you see starts where you had people standing side by side, regardless of gender, regardless of sexual orientation, regardless of what political, political party they belong to or didn't belong to, regardless of religion and, and, um, and socioeconomic classes, which, which hadn't existed, and even ages. You had children, you had adults, you had seniors all standing side by side, denouncing the government, denouncing everything that's been going on in the corruption and the nepotism. And this all is now reflected. And that was the first incident of where you start seeing the dismantling of these barriers. And that is all become reflected in the graffiti that came out of all of that. Uh, so you kind of can see here in this map that um, these massive bubble, like bubbles are kind of where all the major protests occurred. And the bigger ones is you have up, up all the way up north of Lebanon, you have Tripoli. And then you have Beirut in the middle, where that's the, the collective of it happening. And then towards the south, you have Said and Sur. And then this is Beirut. And then you see the center of the Thoda, basically, and Marcher Square, <coughs> where um, all of the protests always occur and always start. So one of the things about how they were able to sound is you have these themes that have came um, that came to light, and one of and I'm going to go through all of these kind of themes that show the dismantling of these kind of tangible and intangible boundaries that were created because of the civil war. So, like what I dubbed as all is fair and politicians war, with these kind of graffiti, um, you'll see on just to know all these photos are taken by me during my field work. Um, so all of this graffiti is prior to the Thoda, a lot of the graffiti, you were not able to really direct anything against the government or say anything negative or really say anything crude. And this was the first time where you really saw graffiti targeted against individual groups, individual figures in the government and individual political parties as well. Um, one of the main chants and main things that you could see literally plastered across the walls was Kilonyane Kilon, which is, means all of them, means all of them, which is you see literally straight parade across every wall. And that is basically like every, every politician, every single one, there's not one of them that cannot be not held accountable. This is another, this is an Arabic, it's a very crude, it says, which means basically uh, fuck all the bitches in the government. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, next is the socio-political commentaries that came out. You had a lot of the graffiti that was very much directed towards um, socio-political issues in the country. So, <coughs> You have um, this one, which is passed, is not passed by Greek. And this one talks about a lot of the police brutality that occurred during the protests. And even now where you had, where protesters were being hit by uh, expired tear gas canisters and water cannons and rubber bullets. And it was a massive issue because it was essentially the police and army who are meant to protect the people were attacking the people. This is another one in reflection to the police brutality, which is I mean, which is on who, like, who are you supposed to be supporting the people or the government, like the government. Um, here's another one in case of revolution break glass. You had a lot of graffiti also that was very sarcastic and very humorous, but also very melancholy at the same time. And this is just one of them where they use a lot of certain cultural significance and cultural motifs. So the, that's a beer can and the beer can is in Maza and that's the national beer of the country. Um, yeah, here's another one, the blind leading the blind. Again, another um, collection to the government. Um, this one says, what is stronger religion or hunger? And this, and this is one of my favorite graffiti, local graffiti writers. Um, he combines calligraphy and kind of an Arabic together. And a lot of, yeah. So he does it twice. He does it here 
he does it again he does another style of it in this photo both of these are in spaces this is in what is the egg which i'll talk about a bit later and um which is based was essentially an uh was um was a is basically a concrete building that was completely abandoned and wasn't fully constructed because of when the civil war hit and it was kind of just left as is and so prior to the soda there was the walls were pretty much just great there was no graffiti there was nothing with the soda the whole entire thing became covered in graffiti and basically became reclamation of that space because that space also has is heavily contested to where a lot of developers have been trying to buy the land and trying to tear that um, building up down. So the next is other queer graffiti. The, I would have to say that at the forefront of this uprising is very much the queer and LGBT, LGBTQ community and, and the women. They took a lot of the load um, in terms of being in the front lines and protecting the rest of the people. Um, you'll see there's a lot of, which again, this did not exist prior to the Thoda. You didn't have a lot of queer, queer graffiti around Beirut at all. If not, it was done very in very small spaces and very sp hit spaces hidden away from major visible areas. So you have in Arabic, the queer la Thoda, so the queer for the revolution. Um, This is basically hope, homophobia, hope, homophobia fails and goes away. So a lot of the subcultures and the underground lives of Beirut, where people have been, where the young people have been able to live and have safe spaces, are very much because of the queer community in Lebanon. They were able to. <coughs> they have been able to create spaces for the rest of the young folk, regardless of anything, to be able to be space, to, to be able to be safe and to escape the realities that everyone has to face on the day to day. All right, so these, all these themes and all these, these existing graffiti has allowed peop, the public to reclaim these, all these contestants and cultural spaces heavily. So this is the egg from the outside. Even the, out, the entire egg was covered in graffiti, both inside and outside. As you can yeah, see. Um, at, a, at some point during the photo, it just all the walls became encased with graffiti that you couldn't even really read what was on them. And I think at a point it came to a point where it didn't matter if you could read it or not, as long as you were able to see that this graffiti existed because just the over compassing of all this kind of secular graffiti that that's been that's rising up just was a form of at this point of just okay great we're taking back our city again yeah this was on this is on a main highway um where they were basically able to block the entire road and they brought in sofas and chairs Again, like I said, at some point it's it's kind of just became a piece over a piece over a piece of tag over tag over tag, where it was just the point of like as much as graffiti can be there, the more there was, the more that laid claim, that legitimate claim for the public. So you see a lot of, and this is a very what was a very this is a very affluent area. And very much was an area that was um, essentially not open to not not open but very exclusionary socioeconomically, ethnic like even not nationality wise. And so this is the first time. I mean, this was like all these walls were pristine clean prior to the photo. So all this has led to the recreation of a city, essentially a new city. And this is um, he's a sketch artist turned street artist called Brady Black. And he had been sketching momentous kind of moments during the Thoda. And he, with the help of an architect called Antoine Atala, uh, were able to create this new map of the center of Beirut, where um, 
which was basically the center or the the um, the base of all of the protests going on. And I'll just zoom in in a bit, so you'll see little parts. So, example, you could see that this entire space where was basically for the one percent and for the rich became a space of dialogue, a space of of sharing, a space of expression, a space of creation, of production, and with all of these stuff from creating food markets, creating spaces of 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 just recreation, even. Um, people were able to create a new city and new boundaries that it were even if they weren't really did not like there wasn't actually the didn't like the fall of the government that you had this new space that had not existed prior that had always been for the political elite for the for the for, for the those in power yeah. so you can kind of see how each space within that area became something central and so you could have the egg where you it was reclaimed and where you had this new uh, new all this new graffiti going on and with the grand theater as well which was a theater um, which was also um had been basically abandoned during the civil war became a, a house for snipers um again was also retaken no one had been in that in years in year like in decades no one had had access to that area um so yeah, I just, so just to wrap it all up basically, so you understand it's just um, all this to say is that this new graffiti continues to go on as well because you had on August 4th, um, a massive explosion that occurred and basically took out a large part of the city and the, the part of the city that where a lot of the space safe spaces and where these kind of spaces existed. And you see that even a more cruder form of graffiti show up um, so yeah, it's just to show how graf the graffiti in Lebanon right now is shifting things, it's changing things, and it's for the good in the sense where even though things are a bit stagnant right now because of the pandemic and because of economic collapse and financial crisis, you still see these shifts in boundaries and stuff. So yeah, um, hope you guys, that's it, hope you guys enjoyed. Great. Uh, thank you, Dina. That's um, yeah, really fascinating to see such changes in physical space in a city, um, you know, really centered around emergence of graffiti. Um, okay, so now it's like audience participation section, um, which hopefully will be as interesting as the fascinating talks. So um, yeah, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A. I'm doing a bit of classic academic on the job training. So I think I then read them out. Is that what happens? <laughs> or I press, answer, I press the answer button and then you see it? I don't know. I'll do that. So we have a question first. Um, <laughs> and I don't know who it's for exactly. So I'm just going to pose it to all three of our speakers and see if you have any perspectives. Um, so we'll go with this question first and then see what else comes and, and I've got some as well. So the first one is, how can we prevent the gentrification of street art? Um, so from Ariel is based in Brooklyn and it seems that brands have more capital power to dictate what goes on walls nowadays rather than any, rather than other collectives who want to provide space for free expression for artists or commissioned walls. Where does the accountability lie? Okay, what happened? I pressed the button. Can someone tell me, did you see the question? What happens? Uh, I can take the first answer. It's okay, okay. Fine. let's go with that. Um, I think this is quite an interesting question in regards to the Street Arts Festival in Mostar, in particular, because it's a curated festival. So it already is kind of navigating these tensions of you know, commercialization, quantification, like uh, in order to run the festival doesn't need a large budget, but it needs to kind of take funding from somewhere so they can fund artists to paint the walls. And this is both a matter of kind of supporting local artists and also bringing international artists to kind of, I guess, boost the profile of the festival. And there's a couple of examples that kind of stick out in terms of this kind of commodification, which I'll just run you through. Um, 
So in 2019, there was a there was a kind of call for artists to apply for local artists as part of um, a, like a Jägermeister sponsored mural. So artists were invited to submit ideas for this mural and they were then given the opportunity to paint it at the festival. And as part of the prize, they would also travel to Berlin um, to paint there. So I believe that the festival kind of saw this as part of the their mission to support local artists, but in doing so, they kind of end up with this mural of a big Jägermeister stag above the city, which is like really highly visible um, from some parts of the city. Um, another example is kind of not from a corporate um, kind of body, but actually um, as part of kind of a more European accession process. So um, I don't know if people are familiar with the European Capital of Culture bids, but um, sometimes cities from outside the European Union um, are invited to kind of bid for the European Capital of Culture status. And um, there was a promotional video as part of Mostar's Mostar's bid, which largely featured kind of the stereotypical images of Mostar that you would see, kind of images of the old bridge, um, the surrounding area, like the old town. And halfway through the video, it kind of switches to kind of parts of the city, which as a tourist, you might not usually encounter. Um, and at the center of this is kind of um, the murals that are part of the street arts festival. But it's quite, it's quite clear that the murals that the video then focuses on are the ones with English language kind of with more kind of branded identity. So the kind of more aesthetically pleasing, easy on the eye murals um, and kind of less about the ones with that political message. So I think this is something that the festival organizers are really having to navigate. Um, and I'm not really sure what the answer is, but I think it's interesting that those pressures are definitely present and they kind of try to, I guess, navigate those things while also making the festival happen year on year. Okay. Does anyone have anything else you wanted to add or should I move to the next one? I, I mean, I, I think just on that, I think I probably I simplistically um, defined street art as sort of the institutional and graffiti as the transgressive and resistant. And I think uh, the, the question from Ariel is, is very, is a, is a good one and it's a challenge, but I think that and especially coming, coming from Brooklyn, I think that the, the heart of graffiti is to not, not care or to, to, uh, combat that, that commercialization. And I understand that there will be a lot of tensions within the artist community. I mean, people like to get paid for their work, um, but it also doesn't stop a teenager from drawing a penis on a very nice mural. This was very common through a lot of street art. Somebody puts up a, a mural and it can be ruined and changed by, by you know, quick, sort of subversive acts uh, anonymously produced. So, and I, I wonder if that underground, above ground commercialization has such tension um, because it's, it's an act that can easily uh, undo some of those things. And I saw in the questions like Louise noted, the Marcus Rashford Burberry uh, street art in Manchester right now, and, and there's, you know, constantly in the northern quarter, the Netflix sponsored um, Stranger Things type of graffiti that advertise those things that um, that maybe there's perceived that those walls are off limits because there's something there. But I think graffiti would speak to that and sort of chip away at that idea. Um, hypothetically, that's I'll leave that. Yeah, I guess maybe I wanted. A question I had is a little bit related, but um, in one of your slides, Lydia, the picture of the two hands or three hands, um, next to that mural on the side wall, there was like a, th a throw up or a 
hip hop style bubble writing piece, which clearly didn't look like a commissioned street art mural um, for a festival. So I, I, I guess I wondered about in that particular site, you know, it looked very respectful to me to put that next to the mural. Is there resistance against the sort of changing of these spaces? Do, uh, have you seen people doing more of that subversive graffiti on those murals? I'm okay to answer now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think like with that particular site, um, it's, it's kind of interesting because the buildings that are around there, um, a lot of the residents would usually apply to have the buildings as part of the festival because of kind of problems with or perceived problems with the kind of unwanted graffiti. Um, and then you also have to kind of make a distinction between kind of random tagging but also um, kind of nationalist graffiti so you have quite a lot of swastikas and also you see uh, the word Ustasha which is also associated with right-wing uh, nationalism in the area so I think it's kind of something that I'm also trying to grapple with like to what extent um, the graffiti or like what the relationship between the graffiti and the street art is. Um, I think in some cases, um, another example with an old glass bank building, which is a kind of ruin in the middle of Mostar, this has a really interesting relationship between the street art and the graffiti where tags are definitely placed over it and there's much more kind of dialogue between the pieces. Um, in West Mostar, I think it's a little bit more tense because of the nationalist graffiti that tends to exist there. Okay, um, thanks. So next question is from Holly. Um, and the crux of it is, why do our panelists think that the graffiti, that graffiti and street art is so overlooked in social movement studies, broader studies? in the context of um, kind of analyzing visual arts and, and so on. Any takers? Yeah, I'll take that. I actually don't think it's overlooked that depending on the where, um, there's a lot that's been done in terms of the Arab Spring, especially when talking about um, Cairo and Tahrir Square. Um, there, um, I think it's more the question that it's not seen as um, informational. Well, I think that's part of what all our talks are trying to show is this form of medium can be very much informational for whatever context you're trying to understand, whether it's you're trying to understand the city, whether you're trying to understand what is the public's perceptions of things and understandings and the urban realities of both the public and what's going on at the time and on the kind of on the street. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely not common in Lebanon. I'm, I'm probably one of the, the one of the few academics that is focusing on that. And it's mostly been the literature I've seen in terms of Lebanon have mostly been focused on more of the more prominent kind of street artists and the ones that gain, you know, Instagram favoritism and such and what's flashy and what's more aesthetically pleasing. And that usually tends to be the case with graffiti as well when you're trying to look at it. But for me and what I've learned through my research is that really the core of the information is all from the random scrawls that you see on the on the on the walls, the really anonymously written ones. Those hold so much more power and those hold so much more information. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks. Any other comments on that one? No, I, um, I, I, oh, sorry, go ahead, Lydia. No, I was just gonna say that um, in the Bosnian context, I know Susan Ford is doing some good work um, on social movements and different kind of spatial relationships between graffiti and street art. So it might be worth checking that out too. And, and Holly, I, th I think it's a great dissertation. Um, 
and in the context of Northern Ireland, you can see quite a bit on uh, murals and curb paintings and and uh, and sort of to territorialization and commemoration that's happening there. Um, so it's another one of those hot spots that gets researched quite a bit. And now uh, Medellin in Colombia as well is on that list as well. So I think there are a few spots and it would be interesting for a dissertation to see if you can take what's written about there and, and give a, a look at a new context. And I know that that's probably a little bit challenging with pandemics and and settings and things like that. But there there is some stuff out there. I think that more transgressive stuff um, where maybe it's chipping away at a, a, a bin, a, like a garbage bin just to leave a mark or um, uh, or things like that. Um, is, is definitely underexplored. Um, and I think there's a lot that you could add to that. So I wish you luck with it. Great. Um, I don't, I sort of don't wanna like give a plug, but the article that um, Eric was talking about, the framework article, I'm just pointing you, you don't have to read what we said if you're not interested, though you might be, but look at the reference list. So we've, I mean, that, Draws, draws on and brings together a lot of social sciences literature about street art. So there might be something there as a starting point. Um, okay, um, so next question um, from anonymous attendee. Does graffiti lose some of its meaning when it's gone through a process of acceptance, i.e. when an artist has to have her idea accepted first by a, a board or group, does that in some form destroy the idea of graffiti. So I feel like it might be, might lend itself to Lydia's context, but if others have um, answers, feel free. Sure, um, I can answer first. Um, I think it's probably important to say that most of the murals, like most of the street art in the street arts festival is kind of murals. Um, and it was quite an exception to have graffiti lettering um, in the festival. Um, but I don't know, I think if the question is kind of getting at, does it lose its authenticity, then I mean, yes, it is curated, but I think what I was kind of interested in my talk to talk about was well, what does it mean when it's curated and kind of look a little bit more deeply at the different power relations that are going on there and what the festival organizers are trying to do. I think my next stage towards research will be looking at then what's missing from the narrative of the festival. So in putting forward or kind of trying to encourage artists to um, have messages of kind of unity or kind of steering them clear of things that might be perceived badly by um, kind of Mostarian citizens, then what isn't happening um and i think obviously the example of artes when he was um kind of wanting to create um this image of kind of the two conflicting currents i think there the organizers had a point that this is a kind of already existing narrative in the mostar public sphere right like it's a context where there's very of a references to the war constantly particularly kind of through dark tourism this kind of thing um but i think there might also be a case that more overtly political messages kind of targeted maybe towards the city might also be missing and that's definitely something that i'm looking at going forward can i ask a question on top of that lydia with regards to the like applications to put a, a mural uh, in that festival is is there any correlation or connection like the better the artist the better the spot that they get in the city or the bigger the space or anything like that that you've seen in your uh, research um i think there is an element of that so the spaces um in the first picture that i showed you with the residential buildings like these are usually for international artists or artists that have a history of kind of collaboration with the festival so maybe they've been there before um and i think maybe it just kind of gives 
kind of artist, a way of saying, actually, I really want a bigger wall to paint. Um, but I think actually a lot of the more interesting artwork is happening not in those spaces. So the more political artwork is kind of happening on spaces where the residents, for example, don't have to approve the, the mural. Um, yeah, I would say that if, um, yeah, well, I can't really draw the map up again, but um, on the map that I showed, there's kind of this very large concentration of murals down the center. And these tend to be kind of on this Santi Cheva street and kind of streets around it. But then when you kind of get off to the side of this, there's kind of murals within car parks. And these are often kind of done by a more local artists, artists from Mostar. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you. So another question um, specifically addressed to, to Dina. Could you speak a bit more um, about how queer folks and women contributed to the space of the Thara and or whether or not the visibility of their graffiti has an impact on larger scales, particularly socio-political impact? Uh, yeah, so prior to the Thoda, um, the queer, queer folk and the LGBT community didn't ever really feel comfortable enough in Beirut to have to voice their opinions that publicly. Um, like I like I had mentioned, there was queer graffiti didn't really exist. It you you would probably catch something like a slogan or or something randomly written on areas that tended to be yes more open. Um, but this was the first time in the history of kind of when graffiti has been creating and stuff that you had queer folk being able to come into spaces and voice their opinions publicly without the fear of judgment, without the fear that they'd be um, arrested by the government and such. That fear has always existed in Lebanon. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a very religious community, a religious country Islamic and Christian and a lot of um, that had instilled fear in the queer community. And I think this was the first time where you had these, this community come out and be like, you know, screw it. And it did have an impact because like I said, they were very much at the forefront of a lot of the creation of the spaces and the rebirth of that part of the city um, where you had these open dialogues of issues and that weren't being also discussed publicly and now we're being discussed because they were able to create these spaces. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Um, another one for you, Dina, um, from Dylan. So Dina, you touched on this briefly, but I was wondering if you could elaborate on the spatial divides in Beirut whether security preventing you from entering neighborhoods or politician connected construction projects not finishing and how street art has specifically tried to challenge this? Yeah, this is actually a really good question. Um, so luckily I grew up in Lebanon. So it's basically my backyard and a lot of the areas I'm familiar with. And if I wasn't familiar with, I have friends who live in those areas. So they were able to, um, let me traverse those those neighborhoods and those um, spaces. Um, the divisions in Lebanon right now are not very physical, so they're not as uh, they're not as you can move. Your mobility is free. It's more the sense of discomfort of going into an area that you know you don't belong in, especially ones like Dahye, which is a very heavy or really this like the, the southern suburbs of Beirut, which are heavily Amal and heavily Hezbollah dominated, you know that there's kind of this sense of discomfort because you are not from that area. And they know you're not from that area. There's a ton of security and they will look at you like, they're like, what are you doing here? And you, ha I've had 
and some cases, yes, I've had to be like, I'm, I'm, you know, talking, Ar talking Arabic always helps also knowing the language is a massive plus. Um, I've had a friend who wasn't Lebanese who has done similar work and they've had much more issues trying to talk to people and trying to get into spaces that I was able to get into. Um, in terms of the reconstruction projects, that's a massive, massive theme throughout my thesis and throughout something I found. Um, gentrification is a massive issue. And a lot of the times the gentrification that happens in Beirut is always comes with the reasoning that, oh, we're using our culture, you know, we're, we're trying to, we're using our cultural heritage as inspiration when really most of it is taking down rather than recreating or, or using something better. I'll, an example of that is um, one of the oldest beer factories in the, the region, it's called La Siza, La Siza Beer Factory. And that had been basically the um, haven for graffiti writers and graffiti artists and just, and visual artists as well to come and create whatever they wanted. And they, and it's been throughout, actually my field work from 2016 till now, it's been slowly being uh, completely just gone away. Although the plans, like the blueprints and the plans to which the company had shown the public said that they're keeping walls or keeping the layout and they're using all the, the walls and, and, and keeping the graffiti and just putting in like new new lofts and stuff when they completely destroyed everything. There's just one main wall and they couldn't destroy it because it happens to share with another building. Um, and you see that with a lot of the makeshift walls also around um, construction projects where it'll say new building and you have a lot of stuff where it's crashing and be like no empty building or a lot of the tagline that has come up is called that's come up recently is old Beirut matters and you see that across um, Beirut a lot now where they're trying to take down these old older sites and stuff so yeah I hope that answered your question. Okay, thank you, Dina. Um, I have a question for Eric. Um, in your presentation, you mentioned something about future work and non-violence and graffiti. I wondered if you could talk a bit more about what you meant. Kelly, I appreciate the plug, um, the <laughs> opportunity for a plug. Um, uh, yeah, that work is based on uh, sort of a, a larger discussion about property damage and nonviolence. Um, uh, particularly if we look at things like uh, Black Lives Matter protests in America this summer, we saw the narrative tended to change towards protests and social movements as soon as uh, it happens. Definitely as soon as there's violence, you tend to lose any sort of uh, moral uh, high ground that comes that, you know, you can debate comes with nonviolent strategies and nonviolent movements. Um, and, but not just the use of violence, the use of property damage. And so it's just a, a look at examining graffiti within sort of that realm as do we see um, graffiti through that lens of property damage and can we still keep it as a, a nonviolent tactic or strategy um, as it was used in Arab Spring as it was used in in many social movements uh, nonviolent social movements earlier so it's just situating it sort of in that realm thank you um, there's a question from Amelia um, I guess to everyone, has there been any evidence suggesting that the beautification of spaces, street art and graffiti has resulted in the edification of a local community in a tangible way, or is the impact of uh, or intention behind more aesthetically pleasing street art more psychological or intangible, such as aspiring, uh, inspiring unity, solidarity and, and hope? I'll answer that. Actually, there's a project that went on and um, called Uzvel, and it was meant to, um, which took place in Uzair, which is basically was the slums of, of the capital of Beirut. And it, they brought a whole bunch of international artists 
and um, local artists to come and basically repaint in the walls to gentrify it and make it more colorful. And the idea is that it would create more jobs and create more like a more touristic attraction. And really it just hasn't. And the people feel even more exclusionary because they weren't part of the process even. Um, so although the intent was to create solidarity and, and really in, 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 in actual fact, it just, it didn't. I mean, at least that's the case with, with this project in particular. And it was um, massive, um, quite controversial because people, the guy behind it was also very much politically motivated and the funding had come from political parties as well. So he kept saying that he had nothing to do with political parties, but then it, it had come out that all the finances and funding for the project had been funded by a political party. And yeah, so in that sense, it, it didn't really create any solidarity at all, but rather just more friction between um, people who didn't live in that area and people who lived in more affluent areas. And it was always very much seen as you had like school trips to go into this area and stuff. So it was kind of being seen like, oh, these people are almost in a zoo kind of thing. So less, yeah, less peace and solidarity. So, yeah. I, w I wonder actually, Birte, if you're there, if you could say something about the Colombian context with it, which you visited in that, with regards to that question. Sorry to put you on the spot. Uh, no, that's okay. Um, so I would say in, in Medellin, the situation was a bit of both. I mean, on the one hand, it was very beneficial to people living in this area that was like economically so totally deprived and it kind of created new jobs and a kind of more inclusive environment and like it displaced violence a bit, um, but it didn't displace it out of the area, it just displaced it into the streets that are not beautiful and not full of tourists. Um, and at the other hand, you could really see that people were quite annoyed with the amounts of tourists that were just walking through the streets uh, every day and, and took away from, from that sort of more community feel that they used to have. And um, a couple of people sort of complained about being in a zoo and being looked at all day long and with the graffiti tours coming through like several times a day. Um, so there was quite a tension between the positive sort of economic benefits it brought to the area and the sort of disruption of, of normal life. Do you mind if I jump in here? Um, I think it's kind of interesting. So with the Mostar Street Arts Festival, they, they do a couple of tours around the festival, but these are free tours that are organized by um, the organization just for people who are attending the festival and kind of local residents. Um, and I think this has kind of at least meant that the impact of the murals in the, paint, the kind of painted areas is a little bit more diffuse in terms of people visiting. And it's also, also kind of slowly shifting the kind of touristic center of Mostar from kind of the old town, which is I mean, pretty much like from, you know, <laughs> June till September, completely ram-packed with coach tours um, and kind of trying to move people away from this kind of very um, small area of Mostar into the city. Um, so I think it does have benefit in that way. Um, and my impression from kind of the conversations that I've had with the residents when I was looking was that because the murals are done with quite a lot of discussion with the residents and the residents associations that are um, kind of responsible for the buildings that people largely do like them. Um, even some residents came out on the balcony to kind of chat to me and show me around the, the mural. So I think that more kind of grassroots and discursive approach that they've taken does seem to have helped, you know, I guess, take people along with them. Um, thank you. I was thinking, I was just thinking about the same question, maybe a little bit outside of a conflict or di divided type setting. And I think there maybe are some examples of other, I guess, physical or real world type 
things that might come from the way graffiti or street art are used or occur in spaces. So I'm thinking about, I know in Melbourne, um, in Australia, there are um, alleyways that are full of, let's say graffiti. So it's not necessarily commissioned or sanctioned murals at all, but the space is still allowed for graffiti to happen. And there it's not just say tourists looking at murals, but that the areas around those alleyways have had a lot of, I guess, cafes pop up, um, art galleries and sort of other things have come from the changes to that space. So, um, and, and in that case, I, I highlight that because it's more around the, the question of graffiti management and crime compared to other cities, which were trying to eliminate that kind of activity. And I highlight that because I'm not talking about, um, you know, murals and or street art, I'm really talking about graffiti as, as being having a, a positive effect. I know we could venture into gentrification, but this is already the center of a, a big commercial district. So, um, but anyway, having a positive physical kind of change in at least maybe not community, but a, a broader public um, space. Um, and I think there are other places too, like Graffiti Alley in Toronto, for example, um, it's probably similar. Um, and I also know of other parts of Colombia, um, which similarly kind of st street market cultures have est been established around places where known graffiti is and so on. So again, um, you know, it's linked to gentrification, but, um, but yeah, just the idea that there might be some kind of broader public space changes that I think as maybe there are some lessons there that could be applied to a conflict type setting. And I think, I would also question what we sort of mean by community as well. Um, so what is a sense of community? And if I take a very broad understanding of community as a group of people with a common or shared interest, maybe those spaces like Graffiti Alley in Toronto, I would argue or also create a space for a community of graffiti writers or community of people interested in public art in that way, which is, I mean, I'm not, there might be a perception, I'm not really saying anyone has told me, but I, I get the sense that that community may be less valuable than another form of community. But but that kind of public art, graffiti writers is a kind of community by that definition. So anyway, so I think, yeah, looking at graffiti scholarship in other areas might lend some learnings to the conflict area is my point. Um, is that enough? Any burning final questions before we done? I can see we've got a couple of hundred attendees, so we should have some more questions, but um, but if not, that's okay. Um, do my usual pause for a moment. No questions. Um, so, well then I wanna really thank our speakers, Dina, Eric and Lydia um, for fascinating um, talks that bring very different perspectives to what I think is a, you know, uh, quite a unified theme around public visual arts and graffiti and in spaces of conflict and peace. So I think it's really useful to hear different perspectives.